It is a great uh, honor and, and privilege to, to be here today to, to welcome Willie Walsh, uh, Chief Executive Officer of International Airlines Group as our guest speaker. Now, uh, this is Willie's third appearance addressing the Wings Club. We were talking about it a little earlier at our table. Uh, we were debating on whether he was actually the first speaker um, at, the, at the Dublin event or the second speaker. But he has been uh, very, very much a supporter of the Wings Club and it's, it's, it's fantastic to have him back here today. Now the last time he actually spoke was in, at the New York uh, Wings Club and that was back in January of 2011. And it was also a very interesting time for Willie because that was a time when the shares of the new company, IAG, uh, first began trading. I think it was actually on the, the day of the presentation or the, the day before the presentation. And so that was a, a very interest, interesting topic for, for Willie at that point in time. Uh, since then, IAG has, has really delivered, delivered on its promise. Uh, it has grown uh, to become a company, a company that uh, this, this past year generated more than uh, 20 uh, billion euros in annual revenue. The group is coming off uh, a fabulous 2014. Um, and it continues to perform extremely well, both financially and from a growth perspective. And it's well positioned for the future. Now, I think some of you probably know Willie. Uh, some of you probably know his background. He's been in aviation a, a very, very long time, uh, which is something that happens to, to many of us. He first joined Aer Lingus as a cadet pilot back when he was a child in 1979. And he worked his way up uh, through the airline ranks. Uh, he held positions as CEO of Futura, a, a Spanish charter airline, CEO of Aer Lingus, and CEO of British Airways, before becoming the chief executive officer for IAG. Willie also holds the position of chairman of the Ireland State Debt Agency. So please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Willie Walsh. Willie? Thank you very much, Marlon, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to be back in Dublin. I'm Willie Walsh, as you heard. Uh, I don't normally introduce myself, but um, this is a true story. Everything you hear from me today will be true, by the way, unlike some of my competitors, and indeed some people in the room. But uh, I was speaking at an event in Glasgow um, a little while ago, and after the event, I went for a drink with a friend of mine. We went to a place called the Horseshoe Bar. Those of you who know Glasgow might know it. It's a, a famous pub in Glasgow. And I was standing at the bar having a pint of Guinness. And this guy came over to me and said, you're Michael O'Leary. <laughs> I, no, I said, no, no, I'm, I'm not Michael O'Leary. He said, you, you're Michael O'Leary. I've, I've seen you on the television. And I said, honestly, I, I'm, I'm not Michael O'Leary. He said, no, no, he said, no, the, the Guinness and the accent, he said, is a dead giveaway. <laughs> You're Michael, and he calls people, look, it's Michael O'Leary. And I said, listen, I'm not Michael O'Leary, but leave me alone. <laughs> so he stands back and he goes, I knew you were Michael O'Leary. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, thank you, Marlon, for inviting me. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, Marlon says I've been in the industry a long time. Uh, I started when I was 17, but he, he reminded me, you know, I'm now a little bit older than that, and it reminded me of a, an incident I had with a, a lady called Ruby Wax. I don't know if you know Ruby Wax, some of you probably do, comedian. She's a bit abrasive, a really nice lady. And uh, we were doing this charity event, and we'd asked Ruby Wax to say a few words. So she comes and meets me in our uh, BA uh, head office at Waterside. And uh, I meet her at the door, and she says, my, you look so much younger in real life. And I said, well, you know, thank you. I said, do you mind me asking, uh, how old are you? And I said, uh, I was 49 at the time. She says, I'm, I'm 49. And she said, 49? <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I've brought a short presentation. I, I, I normally don't do presentations, but uh, I thought given 
there's a lot of interest in, in IAG. I thought I'd just talk a little bit about IAG. So I'll show you a, a few uh, charts here so you can get a better feel for what it is we're doing. Uh, but the main reason I'm here actually is I, I do enjoy a um, you know, good Q&A session. So I'll try and leave time for you to ask questions. Uh, you probably know that uh, I am restricted in terms of some of the things I can say because of Irish takeover panel rules. You're not restricted in asking me the questions, uh, but I may be restricted in terms of what I say. And I have one of my financial advisors in the room, Joe Gill, who's here to jump up and down and shout at me if I start saying the wrong thing. So um, please don't hold back when asking, but uh, I may, as I said, not be able to answer the question. I love this photograph, and I'm sure you all recognize it. Uh, you can see the tip of the Samuel Beckett bridge there in the bottom left-hand corner. This is uh, British Airways A380 flying uh, at 800 feet over the River Liffey during that fantastic flight fest uh, that was organized by uh, Eamon Brennan and the IAA, who I think Eamon is here today. An absolutely fantastic event. The uh, aircraft did three circuits um, over Dublin, and uh, we had a crew training, actually. We'd just taken delivery a short while before that of the aircraft. And you can imagine you have to do, you, uh, you come in to do your crew training, and you're told, what we want you to do is fly over to Dublin and fly along the River Liffey at 800 feet and uh, you know, wave to the uh, thousands of people who will be there to see you. They thought this was an Irish joke until we explained to them what was going on. Now, let me just uh, talk about IAG. As, as you know, we're one of the largest airline groups in the world. We were created in January 2011 when we merged British Airways and Iberia. But there are actually six airlines in the group with British Airways, Iberia, Iberia Express, Vueling, Open Skies, and British Airways City Flyer. We also have a loyalty program called Avios and a cargo business that uh, now is the combined BA and Iberia cargo business. So it's about the 10th biggest uh, air cargo business in the world, IG Cargo. We created this because we believe consolidation is good for the industry, but we also recognize that some of the consolidation that has taken place does not necessarily extract all of the value. And we wanted a structure where strong brands could continue to exist. So we avoided the temptation you know, of coming up with a name like British Airways Iberia. Um, we benefited from following other people. If you look at our logo in the uh, bottom left-hand corner there, uh, it was supposed to be just IAG, and then I left the room and they put that little tail plane or tail in it to make it look uh, sexy, and they added color as well. It was gray when I left the room and they added color to it afterwards. So we wanted to demonstrate that IAG was not a brand. IAG was, uh, if you like, the I don't want to call it a holding company, but uh, IG was the parent company. And where we saw value was in the brands. And we wanted to be able to retain the brand equity and the brand presence. We're a Spanish registered company. Uh, we're listed on the London and Spanish stock exchanges. And our head office is in London Heathrow. And our, our mission is to be the leading international airline group. But we see ourselves as being a multinational and multi-brand airline group. And I think that's very important. Um, we have these three distinct primary brands, British Airways, Iberia, and Vueling, but as I said, there are six. Uh, if you look at BA, carried 41 million passengers in 2014. Uh, it has a prime position in Heathrow. Uh, we hold 51% of the slots at Heathrow. It's the number one airline at London City and uh, number two airline at uh, Gatwick. Uh, we fly about 220 different destinations in, uh, I think it's 82, maybe 83 countries now. Uh, it will be 83. We're starting uh, to um, Kuala Lumpur uh, shortly. In uh, Iberia, Iberia, as you know, the former flag carrier of uh, Spain, it's the number one airline in Madrid. Um, flew 14 million passengers in 2014, and it flies to... Uh, 43 different countries, um, principal area focuses in Latin America, and then Vueling or Vueling, or you can call it anything you like, just buy tickets with us, but it's a Spanish low-cost carrier based in Barcelona. It's the number one airline in Barcelona, and it flies uh, about 320, or just under that actually, destinations in 37 uh, countries. So you can see very different airlines, very different areas, fields of operation, very different target customers. Some of them overlap, uh, some of them don't, but three very distinct brands. And we recognize that the development and maintenance of the brand is something that has real value. 
Uh, you can see there, British Airways is, I would say, a global carrier, uh, flying pretty much most places in the world. Uh, 279 aircraft. Uh, Iberia's principal area of focus is within Europe and then to Latin America and also in North America with 92 aircraft. And Vueling has uh, 90, uh, 92 aircraft flying within Europe. We've got a big base in Barcelona, as I said, but also a base in Rome, Fumicino. Now, the distribution of our capacity is interesting because if you look at that, uh, we have 7% uh, domestic capacity. So that's the UK and Spanish domestic market and actually a little bit of the Italian domestic market as we develop our hub in, in Rome. Um, BA has about 2% of its capacity in the UK domestic market. Uh, Iberia would probably have about 9% of its capacity in the Spanish domestic market. And then Vueling is uh, about 30, 31% in the Spanish domestic market. But overall in the group, we've got operating at a short haul network about 29% of our capacity. So we're, we're very much long haul focused. Uh, about 70% on long haul and 30% on short haul. And the area where we're light relative to some of our big peers is in uh, Asia Pacific, where we've only got 9% of our capacity. Iberia doesn't fly there, BA does, and BA is expanding its network into Asia, and we see that as a growth opportunity. But we're the number one carrier on the North Atlantic, number one on the South Atlantic. We're big in Europe. And uh, we clearly have uh, an interesting profile in Asia, but one that will develop in years ahead. A um, little bit about our operating performance, because as Marlon said, 2014 was a good year for us. Uh, we made an operating profit of just under 1.4 billion euros. That was a 620 million euro improvement on the previous year. The improvement came through uh, the expansion of the company, so our ASKs grew by 9.3%. Um, that was 24% uh, in the case of uh, Vueling, so you can see that as a very fast growing short haul carrier within Europe. Uh, Iberia was about 36 and BA was uh, just under 6%, 5.9%, which is a lot higher than BA would normally do. So the expansion of 9.3% clearly contributed to the top line growth, but the real story for our performance was in our cost performance, managing our ex-fuel costs, the areas where we as a, an airline management team can influence or at least exert some influence. So the real driver of margin growth in 2014 was cost control and cost performance. And that's exploiting all of the advantages of being part of a, a big group where we can uh, use the size of our group to improve our bargaining position with suppliers. And that will continue to be a focus of the group as we go through 2015. So in 2015, we're aiming to grow our profitability at an operating level to over 2.2 billion. And again, some of that will come through growing the business, but most of it will come through even improved cost performance. So there's a lot more that we can do. If you look at the individual companies, you can see they're operating at a different pace. As I said earlier, they've got some different opportunities and different challenges. Uh, we look at the operating and we margin and we adjust it for the difference between leased and owned aircraft. Uh, so we show there a lease adjusted margin that I've highlighted in British Airways of 8.5%. In Iberia it was 35 and in Voiling it was 115 So on margin terms, Voiling is the most profitable part of our group. And you can see uh, Iberia improving uh, 5.1 uh, points of margin improvement. So Iberia has gone through some major restructuring and is uh, really, really coming along well, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but if you look at the performance in Iberia, its ex-fuel costs went down by 7.2%. That's a stunning performance in, in our industry. So a lot of people think the driver behind profitability has been fuel and the lower fuel price. It's not. The driver behind profitability and margin growth has been the control of the costs that we can influence. And everybody in this room, I'm sure, knows there's not a lot we can do about the price of uh, oil. Um, you see there, Vueling, I highlighted it, grew uh, capacity by 24.2% in 2014. It's a fantastic little airline, not so little actually now when you see uh, 21 million passengers, um, but it's really uh, performing well uh, in a competitive side of the market. And you can see the costs uh, slightly different. If you look at the bottom line there, um, the uh, employee costs in Iberia, unit costs improved by nearly 13%. 
uh, but at one euro ninety or uh, one point nine cent, actually euro cent per ASK, it's significantly higher than Vueling, and that reflects the fact that the airlines are different. And again, the beauty of our group, we we know that they're different airlines doing different things, so we're not trying to bring everything to, to the same level. We recognize that there has to be differences and acknowledge that it's the differences between the airlines that make the uh, group stronger in the end. Uh, you won't be able to read that, and uh, um, uh, the font has decided to change itself. It's a positive story. In, uh, so actually, I can lie now because you won't be able to read it. But uh, our balance sheet is the strongest one you'll find around. You know, it's it's a it's a very good balance sheet. We've got about five million euros of cash, and uh, some of the metrics we look at, you can see, our adjusted net debt to EBITDA, which is one of the key measures that. Uh, the rating companies will look at has improved from 2.5 times to 1.9 times. Uh, so uh, a key driver of our management focus is return on invested capital. Uh, we set ourselves a challenging target of 12% plus. We were at just under 8% in 2014 and clearly on a significant path to achieve the uh, re return on invested capital targets that we have set for the business. Just. To give you an idea of what has happened in Iberia, uh, I said Iberia is not just about uh, restructuring of its employee base. Iberia is a fantastic airline, but uh, unlike Aer Lingus, and there you, I just mentioned Aer Lingus and I said I wouldn't, but unlike Aer Lingus, uh, Iberia did not restructure uh, through the difficult times and uh, continued to operate at a level that was out of line with pretty much everybody in the industry. That was unsustainable, and they had to embark on major restructuring. And this gives you an idea of the scale of the restructuring that has taken place, uh, where against the baseline of 2012, when we really started restructuring the business, its uh, labor costs on a unit basis in 2014 were fi you know, almost 15% lower than in 2012. The interesting figure is in 2016, because we've restructured the airline, we can now grow it again. So in 2016, we will have the same capacity in ASK terms as we had in 2012, but our unit labor costs will be 25% lower. So you can just get a feel for how different an airline Iberia is today and the potential that exists there. And look forward to 2020 when our unit costs will be 35% lower against the baseline of 2012. However, not only has its financial performance improved, but its operational performance has improved. And this is just one of the metrics we look at, so uh, punctuality. And it actually is up there as one of the most punctual airlines in the world, operating in a very difficult home environment at Madrid Baracas. But look at where it came from. You know, it was appalling in terms of its punctuality and regularity. So while we were going through this massive restructuring, we actually did really well to engage with our people. And yes, we had some challenges, and yes, we had some difficulties, but having overcome those, and once people understood the need to restructure the business, look at what was achievable. You know, these are record levels of punctuality, record levels of customer satisfaction. The brand is at its highest level that it has ever been, and it's a truly transformational turnaround in a company in a difficult market. So in 2015, we're aiming to do even better. Uh, we want to improve operating profitability to over 2.2 billion. We have no idea what's going to happen to the oil price, uh, but uh, based on the current spot price of about $600 per metric ton and the current euro dollar exchange of uh, 113, our fuel bill is going to be about 5.9 billion euros. It was 5.9 billion euros in 2014. It was 5.9 billion euros in 2013. Uh, but we're a bigger airline, so as we grow the business, our fuel price is remaining uh, roughly static, and we expect to grow capacity by about 5.5%. Um, that will be just under uh, about 2.6% in BA, uh, about 9.3% in Iberia, so you can see we're actually growing the airline fast now because we've got a fantastic cost base, and about uh, 16, just over 16% in uh, Vueling. So very different airlines, very different brands, different customer propositions, different cost base, different revenue base, different growth opportunities, but it's the combination of all of that that makes IAG a success. And it's the reason why we want Aer Lingus to be part of IAG. Because think of everything I've said, it's got a strong brand, you know, really strong brand here in Ireland, 
It's got a really strong brand in North America, particularly East Coast, but in North America, the brand is very strong, very strong brand in the UK. The brand is excellent. It's got a good operating base. It's got a good cost base. Its cost base is as good, if not better, than some other parts of the group. And it's got fantastic growth potential. We see Dublin as a real opportunity to grow on the transatlantic. And we want to be part of that. And we believe we can bring more to Aer Lingus as part of IAG to de-risk the growth plan that Aer Lingus has already come up with, to accelerate that growth plan, to make Aer Lingus an even stronger company uh, under the IAG umbrella, taking advantage of the opportunities that you get from being part of a larger group, but allowing the company the freedom to operate and respond to the specific challenges and opportunities that exist in the markets that they serve. That's why we're different to other airline groups. We recognize that brands have value. We invest in strong brands. And we recognize that our operating companies need to have uh, flexibility, need to have independence, need to be able to manage the business as best they can while we centralize areas that you as a customer will never see, but the areas that will generate value for the group. So it's a great company, which we think can be brought to even greater levels as part of IAG. And I'm going to finish with my favorite photograph. I love this. Um, that was taken on that same day, and uh, you've got the wonderful Aviva Stadium where I was last Sunday cheering on Ireland against, uh, I forget who they were playing, but it was a <laughs> great performance and it was uh, great to be there. So thank you, it's great to uh, have the opportunity to talk to you and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Um, we'd like to present to you a, a, a plaque, a plaque in our appreciation of you um, speaking with us today. It says, presented to Willie Walsh in grateful appreciation of your presentation at the Aviation Leader Series of the Wings Club, Dublin, March 2015. You get to add that to your collection. <laughs> so thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay.